We study billionaires, and this is episode 123 of the Investors Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the perfect cloud accounting solution for international listeners. The software operates in and accepts payments from more than 120 countries. Make your billing painless today at freshbooks.com forward slash TIP. And if you use our bonus code TIP, which stands for the Investors Podcast, you'll get access to a free 30-day trial. No credit card is required and you can cancel anytime. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is the Investors Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. All right. How's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Seoul, South Korea. And we are back with the second part interview with Wesley Gray. And Dr. Gray comes to us with a wealth of information and experience, and he understands value investing, momentum investing. He's written four books. If you didn't catch our first part interview with Wes last week, which was episode 120, you really need to go back and start there before you would listen to this episode, because you're going to be coming into the middle of a conversation and some of it's not going to make sense. And if you're a hardcore value investor like myself, you might come in a little biased and not really understand the full context of what it is that we're discussing. So I'd really challenge you to go back and listen to the previous episode before listening to this one. So Wes, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. And Stig has the first question. Wes, investors might be interested in momentum investing, but for various reasons, because due to perhaps the cost structure, they might not be inclined to own a large basket of stocks. And they might also like the process of conducting research on the individual stock picks. So the thing I'm curious about is, does it make sense for the investor to spend time on individual momentum picks to improve returns? And if so, how would he or she look at the individual pick? Well, so if you're trying to develop a basket of momentum stocks to capture momentum exposure, there's no evidence whatsoever that I've ever seen where if you kind of like want to look at quality, let's say like we see some high momentum names and we want to go in there and try to pick the highest quality based on some fundamental analysis. The cold hard truth, as far as we see it and what the data says is fundamental analysis just does not matter when it comes to momentum. Like it's momentum is what matters. So I think there would be absolutely no point of doing that. However, Let's say that you want a baby step into using momentum as a value investor. If you don't want to just go the kind of, I guess, what the, the evidence-based way would suggest where you just have a pure momentum and a pure value, you may be a value investor doing your fundamental analysis. And then one of the things you might want to entertain is what's the relative price momentum on this thing? Because we know even if you just do cheap stock investing, within that, if you say we're cheap stock, but some cheap stocks have high momentum, some have low, those cheap stocks with high momentum would probably be a good place to look. So you could still use momentum in the context of a pure value investing framework, and arguably it would at least give you better odds of at least searching in the right fishing pond. So Wes, I'm kind of looking at this as you know a viable option to implement into my value investing-based approach. And I guess my concern is how much of my equity exposure should be dedicated to value investing versus this momentum approach. And when I say that, you know, sure. some of my portfolio might be fixed income, some of it might be commodity based, some of yep. it might be currency based. So let's just say, like right now, I think that a smaller equity exposure is better based on where yeah. the macro perspective is. Mm -hmm. And so Let's just say that 40% of my portfolio is equities. How much of that 40% of my overall portfolio would you say would be appropriate to dedicate towards momentum versus just straight value? Well, what I'll do is I'll just tell you what I do with my personal money. Obviously, everyone's got their own circumstance and you really got to be a believer because 
What yeah. I'm about to tell you is for the believers that get it and they just want to compound in expectation. So what I do is, you know, the baseline is just 50-50, right? That's the brain dead version of doing it. And that's not a bad approach. However, we believe in kind of like you want to kind of make sure you're getting the same risk amount from each bucket. And the reality is that a dollar invested in value stocks doesn't generate the same amount of risk as a dollar invested in momentum stocks. So if you have 50-50, like if you have 100 bucks, you put 50 in value, 50 in momentum. From a risk perspective, you're more exposed to momentum, right? Because it's just got more bang for its buck. So what we do is what they call like a risk parity or vol weighting approach. It's just a fancy term, but since you're just trying to balance the exposures, and it nets out typically to 60-40 or, or sometimes 70-30. So as you mentioned at, the, at another show, so that would mean you're going to be overexposed to value. We're typically around like 60% and then around 40% to momentum. Just because momentum, you don't need as much allocation to get the volatility and risk from it. Now, I'm really curious, and I know that this really kind of relates to a specific point in time. So people that are listening to this three years from now or you know, way into the future, this isn't necessarily going to apply. But a lot of the people listening to this right now would be very curious to hear your opinions on asset allocation and positioning based on the current market conditions. Because when we look at the current market, yes, interest rates are super low, which gives I guess people cause to believe that a higher price is justifiable. So if you're looking at a PE ratio across the S&P 500, it makes sense that it should be higher because interest rates are so low. But in that same breath, we're seeing CAPE ratios right now in the US that are literally the highest that they've ever been except for 2000. So when you go across the last 100 years, we're seeing some really high prices in the US equity market. So I'm really curious, what do you think is an appropriate positioning in stocks in, you know, here we are, December, 2016. So again, unfortunately, we're just all about evidence. I mean, what's kind of the, what's the data-driven decision here? And so we don't really make calls and we just got reminded of this because if you would have told people before Trump got elected that the stock market was going to go up 10% for small caps in November, they would have thought you're like the craziest person on the planet, right? So being able to predict based on gut or whatever's going on, like I just can't figure it out. Not really sure many can. Some folks are smart enough, maybe they can do it. What we do, and it's going to sound ridiculous, but it's just what the evidence suggests is we are trend followers. It's kind of like momentum, but as we mentioned with stocks, stock momentum is about relative strength. So how much relative price appreciation you got to everyone else in the world. Trend following is basically looking at the same asset relative to itself. And if something's in a positive trend, ride the wave. The minute that trend busts, de-risk and don't focus on valuations. Like we've looked at so many ways of trying to tactically allocate based on valuation metrics. And everyone knows the data. You know, if you buy one when the capes are crazy, the 10-year expected returns are horrific and the realized ones are. But when you try to tactically implement that in a portfolio, like to create a, a trading rule out of that to see if it can actually benefit you, you just you can't. The only one that can is trend. So if the thing is trending, even if it's insane, just own it. The minute it stops trending, blow out. And that's really important in like high valuation markets where yeah, it's just you got to follow the trend. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting on cash for five years and miss out on a 3x in equity markets. You know, it's funny that you say that because this is exactly what we see Stanley Drunk and Miller do. I mean, you talk about a guy who can compound better than anybody on the planet. This is exactly what he's doing. He, you know, Trump came out, he was a huge bear for all of 2015. I mean, he owned, I don't know how much gold, 25, 30% yeah. percent of his portfolio was in gold going up to the election, the night that he found out that Trump had won, he sold his entire gold position and went long equities. And it was like, everyone's just like, has their hands in the air. Like, what in the world is this? Yeah. And that's exactly what you just described. So I'm curious. So based on the trend that you're describing here, yeah. you guys are highly exposed to equities then at this point. 
Not really. So I mean, I can tell you because literally we just did it today. But basically, U.S. equities, long and strong, international, fully hedged commodities. I think we're all in on those bonds, flat, no duration bond exposure. Yeah, really, the only thing you're long is U.S. equities. Based on trend, you want to be kind of protected right now besides U.S. And Stig, I want to highlight something for the audience really fast before we go to the next part here. I think it's really important that people that are hearing that have to understand that Wes could change that positioning in a very short amount of time. Like he's saying that he's long equities right now, but that doesn't mean that he's going to hold that position in six months from now. It might be completely different. Correct, Wes? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, you got it. And if you're going to do what essentially what we're talking about here is market timing, we only dabble in it with trend following. And it's one of those things where if you're going to do that, you need to have like the iron will of, you know, Navy SEAL discipline and stick with it. Otherwise, if you can't do that, just do some static Vanguard buy and hold or go buy some, you know, like you guys promote like value stocks and companies you like. And just don't think about it because getting into market timing, unless you kind of know what you're getting into, is really kind of a dangerous thing for most people. Wes, I'm curious about what you said about being long American equities because if you look at like an overview of all the Cape ratios, America's is definitely one of the more expensive markets. So is that because momentum investing doesn't work internationally or what does the evidence say? As far as I remember in the book, in most markets, Momentum investing was actually a good strategy. So what's the reason for your current allocation in that case? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there's, and this is something we try to clarify. So there's stock picking momentum, which is using that relative strength measure we talked about in the first episode. And that's where you take, you know, a thousand stocks, rank them on their last 12 month returns. And if they're in the top 100, those are good. If they're anything else, you don't want them, right? That's stock picking momentum. So if we're going to own equity, we always want to have an allocation to that kind of exposure. Either you want to own the cheap stocks out there and you want to own the momentum stocks out there when you want to own equity. So right now, U.S. equity trend is strong. So we're going to own value and momentum securities. International equity stinks. So we're not going to own any equities, no matter if they have the best momentum in the world, because the trend in that broad asset class is just not worth the risk to buy into that kind of the equity risk over in a non-trend market. That's essentially kind of, there's two things. There's the stock selection momentum, which is about picking stocks. And then there's the, when do I actually want to own equities? And that decision, at least if you're into market timing, and at least evidence-based market timing, it usually revolves around some sort of trend system. So Wes, do you have any tools on your site that provide some of this information to people to show where your positioning is going at certain points in time? Yeah. yeah. So we, on our tools on our website, we wrote another book, DIY Financial Advisor, which just as the title suggests, it's how to be your own financial advisor. There you go right there. (laughs) And so we have tools where we basically map that out every month for basically the system that we talk about in that book. But in addition to that, because we're kind of somewhat agnostic, we also post a lot of equity weights or asset allocation weights for a bunch of other whiz bang models people promote like risk parity and you know all these other things I and mean, it's all free you got to sign off that you're you know financial professional so they don't get sued but to the extent that you're comfortable doing that and you feel like you know what you're doing yeah go in there and you can go crazy yeah and i just want to put it out there that We actually recorded two episodes with Wes more than a year ago about momentum and value investing. So Wes, this is your chance to give a hard sell, (laughs) as hard of a sell as you can muster to that hardcore value investor. I mean, you could really give this to me because that's kind of the camp I fit into, but sell somebody on why they need to really consider momentum into their strategy, like really lay it on them thick. Got it. Got it. Well, let me give you a thought experiment. And this is what myself as a value investor got me really thinking about momentum investing. Because you got to, for value guys, you got to map it back to fundamentals because that's how we're wired to think. Great. So let's say, and I think I have an example in the book we can even talk about recently. Let's say you're out in the valley in Palo Alto. You got 
LinkedIn, and you got Google. Okay. LinkedIn blows up 50%. Google keeps grinding for whatever fundamental reason. Now, one would think that, you know, markets are efficient. You know, it's all about discount cash flows. Price action doesn't matter. Well, let me tell you something. Your cost of capital when you have a turd stock that lost 50% of its equity value is way higher than a hot stock that everyone wants to own and every banker in the street wants to sell, right? So right there, the pure price action itself can affect through what Soros calls like reflexity feedback loop, your actual fundamentals because your cost of capital relative to your competition, even though fundamentally nothing's changed except the fact your price blew up and the other guys didn't, it, it actually fundamentally screws you. Not only that, if you're the employees and you're a human, because all employees are humans, when they see a company that's blown out 50% of the equity and they're thinking, ah, you know, a lot of this is an option value. I want to be here for a long time. And then across the street, they got the one where the stock price is going up four or five times. You know, they got like donuts for free everywhere. They're going to be able to attract way better human capital because a lot of that human capital, they're not value investors. They're not, you know, thinking like, oh, like, well, why would I want to work at, you know, the overpriced company that's burning money on stupid stuff. I want to go work at this boring one that just blew up and is like a total great value investment because they want to work at this place. So just price action can affect so many fundamental things without fundamentally anything changing. Cost of capital gets way cheaper just by having great price action. Human capital acquisition, the ability to maintain it is way cheaper when you have great price action, right? It's just a fact. And so price action itself can have nonlinear second derivative effects on fundamentals that go underappreciated by the market because it hasn't shown up yet. And that's something to think about there because now momentum, even if you push all the wacky technical analysis things aside, we start thinking like that. Now we're thinking, wait a second. Maybe that price action is actually creating fundamental value that value investors never even consider because they're so buried in like the financial statements. Yeah. Right. But it's real fundamentals that might be fundamentally changing things. And we should account for that. And, you know, I think a lot of what momentum's mojo is about is that kind of stuff. Then the second one is, I mean, it's just straight up facts, man. You know, there's a lot of theories about why value investing is in many respects, maybe just risk in a hidden clothing because like distress risk, you're buying all kinds of weird tail risk things that, that you know, they just don't know about. And, you know, a lot of people argue about this. I don't, I'm not a believer on that, but there are people that intellectually argue that pretty sufficiently. When it comes to momentum, even like Eugene Fama, the dude that invented efficient market hypothesis says, this is insane. We cannot explain this and there is no risk-based story that has any real credibility. So it's just, it's a fundamentally more empirically robust phenomenon than value. So it's just purely the data's there to support it. And that's all fine and dandy. Now, why does a value investor have most the gain from momentum? Because value investors are those that are the least likely to ever want to touch momentum. And a lot of momentum people are the least likely people that want to own some boring, you know, stupid value stock. But now we've got a hidden diversification portfolio benefit where you know, I'm my hardcore value guy, Roger that. But if I can couple something that has the equal level of octane, but it tends to yin when my value stuff is yanging and I can kind of, you know, help diversify that volatility and, you know, allow myself to sleep better at night. There's arguably some value in that, but there's only value in that to the extent, and it's the same reason value investors, the hardcore ones are successful. You got to believe, you got to understand, and you got to have iron will. I'm curious, Preston, are you convinced? And I'm saying this as I'm smiling and it's really not to be rude or anything like that, but it's really, really hard as a value investor to think to include something like momentum investing in your portfolio that is purely based on price action. It just feels wrong in a way. But I think that the, the argument that you're putting out there, Wes, I think they're really, really good. 
So I'm just thinking, Preston, let me just put it on you first. Were you convinced? To be honest with you, I, I am convinced a little bit here. The thing that it really gets at, though, is Wes's last point of this isn't something that you can just go out as an individual person and kind of do the analysis on by looking at a couple different companies that have a lot of price action on them because you're going to have gaping holes in the analysis. I think you really have to have some type of program. You have to have some type of source of data that's consolidating the swath of companies across, call it the US market or wherever you're looking, and give you a good basket that you would then have to re-optimize. And this would require a lot of time. And for you know, a lot of people out there that maybe only have, call it 10K or 50K to invest, there's no way you're going to go about doing this approach because it's just too time intensive and resource intensive. But If you're a person with a high net worth, I think that this is something that is definitely worth considering if you have a very good execution of rebalancing a portfolio and looking across the entire index of stocks. And the other thing to give a a small pitch on momentum, even if you're just a hardcore value investor and implementing momentum in its purest form is not up to you and you don't want to go buy someone else's stuff or whatever, you know, Roger that all good. It still might be useful as a value investor as kind of like another indicator. I'm buying my cheap stocks, but maybe at the margin, you know, I give a little bit of extra benefit to those that have high momentum versus low momentum. Because we know from Evan Space standpoint, you're basically stacking the deck in your favor at the margin. And that's something that everyone could do with a lot less, you know, brain damage than running a pure quant momentum strategy. All right, guys, hang in tight because we're going to take one minute to tell you about today's sponsor. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about one of our favorite tools that we use here at the Investors Podcast, and it's the cloud accounting software called FreshBooks.com. The software is like having your own accounting assistant, and it tells you if any of your clients have not paid on time. It also shows you if they viewed their invoices, and it can even send clients automatic late payment notices. FreshBooks is built for small business owners, not for accountants. But if you have one, you can export all of your data into a single file and forward it with one simple click. Accounting doesn't get any easier than this. For a free 30-day trial, go to freshbooks.com forward slash TIP. No credit card is required and you can cancel any time. Remember, when you see the section that says, how did you hear about us? Make sure you use our coupon code TIP. All right, now back to the show. All right, so Wes, last week we had you answer a question from our audience, and we want to do the same thing again this week as long as you're up for it. Sure, of course. All right, so this question comes from Eileen Phillips, and uh, let's go ahead and fire away here. Hi, Preston and Stig. My name is Eileen Phillips from Orange, California, and I'm a huge fan of all you young value investors. You're like my team. Thanks so much for your podcast. I really don't mind traffic. In fact, I'm often listening to you in the garage because I want to hear the end of your podcast. So I have two questions. First one, can you explain what shorting the S&P 500 does for a stock portfolio? Does it just balance huge drawdowns or why would that be something you might do in the current market? And my second question is, as a reading teacher who would like to inspire my students to read more, What single person or event most influenced your becoming lifelong readers? Thanks again and love the podcast. Hey, Wes, before I throw it over to you, I want to quickly respond to that second part because that's one I'm really passionate about. Eileen, I want to tell you, for me, I was not a big reader whenever I was younger. And one of the things that inspired me to start reading a lot was I was highly interested in investing. And when I started studying Buffett and Charlie Munger and some of these other people, the one thing that I saw that just kept coming up more and more was that these guys were obsessive when it came to reading and expanding their knowledge. They would constantly be talking about how all they did, their number one attribute is that they'd read, they'd read, they'd read. And then I kind of started turning my car into a learning laboratory where you know, I started off just like Wes, I started off in the military. And so I'd always had these half hour drives or 40 minute drives into work. And there was just one day where I was like, you know what? I'm going to just stop listening to music. 
I'm not going to listen to music anymore. I'm going to turn my car into a learning laboratory. I'm going to educate myself in my car. Anytime I get in my car, I'm going to educate myself. And for me, that was a major turning point with reading in my life. And now for much more than a decade, every single time I get in my car, I'm learning something new. So that has had such a profound impact on my life. I can't even describe how much of an impact that's had on my life. And that's my quick story on that. Now I'm going to throw it over to Wes so that he can answer your question. Yeah, I love that, Preston. I think that's great. And so Eileen had two questions. That first one was, I guess, what was the benefits or cost of shorting the S&P 500? In general, barring one status as a professional who knows exactly how and what they're doing, I wouldn't recommend shorting anything just because it's a dangerous game. In general, when you short the S&P, or let's go back, when you long the S&P, what do you get? Well, typically what you get over the last 100 years is you're going to get the risk-free rate, let's say 10 duration bond return, plus three to 400 basis points, which is what they call the equity risk premium. So the premium for holding risk. You know, historically that's been, you know, around 9%. Nowadays with, you know, 10 years at like two and a quarter plus three or four, that's maybe 6% or something, right? So that's if you're long the S&P. So when you short the S&P, you're eating that as now as a headwind. So the benefit of shorting the S&P is obviously if the market blows up, you gain, or if you have other long exposures in the rest of your portfolio and you want to hedge out kind of what they call the market risk or the market beta, you know, you can get rid of that risk. However, it comes at a huge cost. It comes at the fact that now you're essentially paying, you know, the risk-free plus three to 400 basis point equity risk premium. And that's now not a tailwind, but a wind in your face. So I would avoid in general, just don't short equity markets. If anything, just sell down your stocks if you can't handle it. Yeah, I would completely agree with you, Wes. I mean, it's not only a question about not shorting equities. It's probably a question about not shorting anything unless you really, really know what you're doing. And in that case, and if someone would be interested in an approach like that, I think that for some types of investors, it might be beneficial, say, shorting the S&P 500 and going long individual value stocks. That is an approach that one can definitely take up. It is definitely a risky strategy. It's more like a hedge fund strategy. And you might only want to do that for a part of your portfolio. But the reason why I bring this up, and it's not necessarily something I recommend, but I just want to bring this up because what Wes talked about before in terms of beta, in terms of how is that related to the market, that might be one way of, if you think about it, you were taking away the stock market risk because if the stock market should drop with call it 20% and your pick or across the board of your picks might drop only 10%, you will actually make a gain. So that is another way to be investing in the equities market that's definitely by all measures, regardless of how you're going to measure it, is all value at the moment. Yeah, and that's actually a great point. And you're just, again, highlighting that if you do it, it's going to require another level of sophistication. We actually have an old article. It's called creating a tax-efficient hedge fund, and essentially what you mentioned there, Stig, if you believe in value, but you don't want to deal with the equity risk, you know, a DIY hedge fund is, you know, go buy individual value security names, short out the S&P risk. So now you're basically spread betting between what you think your value stocks are going to do relative to what the S&P is going to do, but you're not like exposed to if the market blows up 50%, you know, that's going to be painful. Now you're just exposed to how well your stocks do relative to, you know, S and P stocks. So, and you're basically creating your own hedge fund. But to the extent you don't even know what a hedge fund is, or you don't know how a hedge fund works in a portfolio, you definitely shouldn't be creating a DIY hedge fund because it's just, you know, piling bad things on top of more bad things. But it can be a really powerful thing. But in general, it's just you probably want to avoid it unless you kind of know what you're doing. Are you willing to invest some time and education on it? And to the book question, well, I mean, heck, I think Preston did a really great job. And I think for me, like I've always been a reader, just naturally just always like to learn stuff. But going back to the military, you know, I I think it's really got beaten to my head there. You know, I was a second lieutenant. You don't know anything. 
and you're about to go get shot at, you know, it'd be nice to have some experience. Well, it's hard to get experience getting shot at. And so that's why I just like reading because you can have the experience of a hundred year old man as a 20 year old because you just read a lot of books and, and you get experience through, you know, reading and understanding what other people have gone through. I want to add some more to that too, Wes, because I completely agree with the point you were making there. A lot of the times I talk to people about the difference between reading books versus reading articles on the internet. And I am much more opinionated and biased, if you will, to reading books because I guess I look at it this way. If somebody took the effort, because Wes can definitely attest to this, when you write a book, it is such a major undertaking and such a drag. That barrier to entry to write a book tells you that the person who wrote that subject really is passionate and has just a depth of knowledge that the typical person doesn't have. They have an expertise in that specific thing that they wrote the book on. So you're gaining this insight from a person who's really an expert versus somebody who just wrote a couple paragraphs and posted it on Wikipedia. I feel like you're getting a whole different level of understanding and knowledge when you go to books instead of just articles. If there's no reason to really go deep into something, then yeah, the articles will suffice. But I think really focusing on books is so important. I can't stress it enough. In just a, I think a a life lesson, which revolves around what you just mentioned there revolves around investing. It revolves around pretty much everything. You got to do painful stuff to get gains. If it's easy and it feels good, like reading some cheese ball article on Facebook, you're not gaining anything, right? So things that have any value typically have to be painful and annoying because otherwise it wouldn't have any value. So, you know, value investing is great because it sucks. Moment investing is great because it sucks. Reading books is great because it sucks. Yeah, so I, I, I just agree, man. You, you got to just embrace the pain if you want to ever get better. And I can definitely say as a teacher as well, Eileen, it's going to be an easy sell for you to your students. Just do whatever you think really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, be what, so easy to that's what we learned from Jesse Itzler. Remember from... Uh, that's so, true. Wes, I don't know if you heard this, but we did an interview with the owner of the Atlanta Hawks and... He hired a Navy SEAL to live with him for 30 days. and that's- I think I, I saw that. He, David Goggins, right? Yeah, David. He was the Navy SEAL guy that moved in with, with Jesse and his family. I think I learned about that. Listen, your guys' podcast. <laughs> yeah, that guy's a beast. I was telling my partner, I was actually doing a burpee workout and, you know, feeling <laughs> sorry for myself. And then, you know, this guy has the world record for pull-ups in 24 hours. Yeah. He does like 4,000 pull-ups. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's crazy. You well, gotta, well, that was his you motto. Know, that, that was his motto in the book. It was one of his exact quotes in the book. He said, if it doesn't suck, we don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, huge, I agree. Huge um, shout out to Jesse Itzler. And we can't promote his book. I'm telling you, you want to read a hilarious book that's going to give you just countless amounts of motivation and inspiration. You need to read this book. We'll put it in the show notes if anyone's listening to this, but wow, what a book. I I love that book. I can vouch for it. Everyone should listen to that podcast you guys did on it. That was (laughs) epic. The rap song at the end where we rapped to him was probably a little bit over the top, but you know, we'll have it. <laughs> well, what, what, what can you do, man? That's why you guys got a huge following. You guys go above and beyond and do the tough things, you know, that make it matter. Yeah. The rap definitely sucked. So I guess we followed his advice. Remember, I was like hiking around, training for some event, listening to that podcast. And, I, and now that you're reinvigorating my memory, because now I was like, wait a sec. I've heard this story and I'm like, wait a sec, that's you guys. And now I do remember this rap thing you did because I remember like laughing out loud, like in the midst of pain, thinking, these guys are insane. <laughs> my, <laughs> this is a great podcast. My wife and kids heard it and they just looked at me and they're like, there's no way you were going to air that. And I was like, oh yeah, we're airing it. <laughs> they just looked at me yeah. like, you are not going to have anybody <laughs> listening to your show after that. All right, Eileen, fantastic question. I love that one. For submitting your question, we are going to give you a free subscription to our Intelligent Investor video-based course that goes chapter by chapter, step by step, all through video. We're also going to give you the TIP Academy course, How to Invest in ETFs, where we outline the process step by step. 
we just can't thank you enough for submitting your question. So for anybody who's listening to this, if you want to get your question played on our show, go to asktheinvestors.com. You can record your question there. And if it gets played on the show, you get a free subscription to our video-based learning website. All right. So Wes, we cannot thank you enough for coming on. I know that people listening to this interview, are they have to be blown away because you take things to a whole new level. And we were just so excited having you come back on the show. There's a chance Wes might join us for the Omaha event, going to the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting. He isn't able to commit to it 100%, but we're hoping we can convince him. So if you follow us on Twitter, Wes is on Twitter. We'll have his Twitter handle into our show notes. Please send him as many messages as possible and bug him and say, you better come to the Berkshire meeting so that we can have some more one-on-one conversations with you and our audience. So Wes, please give our audience a handoff to some of your products. The name of his book is Quantitative Momentum, and he has a bunch of other books out there. But Wes, give people a handoff to some of your sites and where they can find you. Yeah, sure. So as far as books, we've got Quantitative Value, which probably be more amiable to a lot of the value investing audience out there. DIY Financial Advisor, which is just like the title says, how to do this stuff yourself. And then Quantitative Momentum is basically the book written for value investors on why momentum is interesting. You can reach us at, like I said, alphaarchitect.com and we're for profit. We've got ETFs out there that actually do you know, deep value and deep momentum investing, run managed accounts and do a lot of other services. But our overriding mission is power investors for education, which is why I love what you guys do. And if I can make it to that meeting, I'll try to make it out there because I love to meet your audience. And I think you guys are just doing a great thing for investors out there. All right, Wes, thank you so much. And thanks for coming on the show. That was all that we have for this week's episode of The Investor's Podcast. We'll see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 